in the house, Ken Newberger, Executive Director of Mississippi Medical Marijuana Association, along with Dr. Ken uh, Kirk Kennard, President Pain, uh, Paws Pain and Wellness, and uh, he's also a member of the Mississippi Board of Medical Licensure. Good morning, guys. How are you? Morning. Good morning, Paul. Ken, it's good to, see, good to see you, sir. You too. Uh, everything okay since the last time we visited? Everything's going great since the last time we visited. We finally um, weathered the whole legislative session. I was going to ask you about that because, in, in before we get to this, because we got plenty of time to do this this morning, um, is, is any of the bills that you want to comment on that that came out the right way or not or didn't didn't make it? You know, I think the what I, I talked about last time we were here, which is yeah. um, House Bill eleven fifty eight, came out great. It made small tweaks to the program without drastically altering it, so we can finally see how this thing's going to play out. You think the course corrections? Uh, has the governor signed it? First of all. Yes, he did. He signed yes, it. Yes, I um, did. What, what were those ago, tweaks? What was it? I, I forgot. There's been so many different bills. but Well, um, some of them had to do with uh, things like moving the requirement to finish your build-out for a dispensary from 12 mm -hmm. months to 18 months to give people a little bit more time to get their business in order. Um, and then a couple of them, uh, Kirk, I think you can talk about some of the ones that impact. Good morning, Kirk. How are you, Dr. Hey. Kirk? It's good to see you, sir. Paul is Good to see your face, and uh, I have listened to your show for well, quite some time. Well, I appreciate um, that. I did notice uh, on the TV screen was a ball head that was reflecting some uh, lights on it. Not mine, thankfully. No, it wasn't yours. It's one, it's, it's one thing I I, I've held on to. <laughs> Perez was adjusting some things there, so well, I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I feel prepared for this. I'm, I'm anxious to kind of speak to whatever you yeah. want me to, but especially the clinical side of things. I've heard some of your I other do. I want to get into that. Well, we got more time on the other side, but I was going to clear most of the legislative stuff. But uh, anything on the legislature when you talked about some of the course corrections that were needed, which was no, everybody knew this, that we're, we're going to go in and see what was working, what was not working, and and also what, what did we miss in this uh, massive legislation. So speak to that. Yeah, okay, certainly. So the board original rules governing clinicians in the state, which is their responsibility, mm -hmm. uh, were, were originally simply to mirror those of the the law. And they did, with the exception of one, which was a uh, carryover from chronic opioid therapy and the expectations of, of those clinicians guiding that treatment for patients. And that, that drug screen requirement is pretty much a standard of care in that field of chronic pain management, especially with opioids. So we carried over a drug screen requirement for medical cannabis that was struck. So it wasn't struck in the sense that you cannot perform one. You can no longer perform one if you're certifying for medical cannabis. You just can't use the result of it to deny an individual a card. Oh. So it puts you in a little bit of a predicament there as a clinician. And so we're our clinics are trying to figure out how we will continue to use it or not. But a little known fact, in 2016, the CDC actually published a, a silent, if you will, uh, policy statement that they recommended against testing for THC in chronic opioid therapy patients. And the basis for that uh, ruling, whatever you think of the CDC, uh, clinicians know those letters and they perk up when you say it. Um, mm -hmm. The basis was that if you had an otherwise responsible patient taking their opioids, making their visits, and otherwise being compliant, and they were also using cannabis medicinally or uh, possibly recreationally, and you you dismissed them from your pain clinic, what are they to do then? They, they will go to the street and possibly find another source, another drug to replace it, which could be more dangerous to them. Through its history, cannabis has not uh, resulted in an epidemic like some of the other drugs. And so I've come to grips with it in my mind, and I wanted to speak to my cl clinician colleagues out there, mm -hmm. try to get them caught up with where I am, because I've immersed myself in the literature in the last year, and I, I was in the heart of the opioid epidemic. And so I'd like them to understand where I am with it through, through that 15 years of practicing pain management and board certified anesthesiologist and and um, right, so good, I, i'm good. right there with a lot of them in the in the strife but i found a comfort zone so, ken yeah. uh, and i want to continue this one but ken one of the things that um we always talk about the questions hanging out there 
Is marijuana a gateway drug to other drugs? And and you have to you have to place that in this narrative or this conversation. This is this is outside the scope of just on the streets and everything else. It's well regulated because it's in uh, in the laws of the Mississippi Medical. So you're dealing with a physician here mm-hmm. or healthcare uh, pr- pr- uh, provider. So any anyway, you you kind of take that out. Uh, because I think any doctor, and I'm, I'm sure you're the same way, your thoughts on this, uh, Dr. Kennard, uh, as far as you say it's not going to be a gateway to another drug, but you can have the same thing as far as opioids are concerned. Absolutely. So if if you want to abuse a substance, it's it's readily available. Mm-hmm. Uh, just go to local CVS, right? So in, in that respect, like I said, in its history, it has not proven itself to be an epidemic drug. So, and, and what I mean by that is yeah. it hasn't proven to ravage society and destroying lives. And even when mixed with opioids inside of the walls of a, of a, of a respectably operating pain clinic, it does not produce that respiratory suppression, that ability to breathe. It doesn't uh, combine with opioids to, to enhance that effect. In fact... It enhances the analgesic effect of it. And so what I did not want to happen with this after I learned these facts, because if those weren't facts, I really don't have much to stand on as a former and current pain management practitioner. If it's if it's a me too, if cannabis is a me too to opioids, we don't have much, right? Because we have an opioid problem and we could potentially have a cannabis problem. I do not, I do not in my heart believe and through the literature that I've read, mm-hmm. that that is the case. So, um, you know, I don't think it's a gateway. I think, obviously, your, your brain is the gateway. And so there's a lot more evidence that smoking uh, tobacco in your formative years mm-hmm. is a bigger risk for, for stronger drug use later. Sexual abuse as a, as a child and, and smoking cigarettes has lots of data. Right. How, how do you do this? How do you... What's the juxtaposition between saying, okay, marijuana is just another tool for me in my, in my battle for uh, pain management? Uh, and then you go back and you look at history and all of that, and, and, you're, just, and you're, you're basing some of your opinions on that one. But yes. it ain't the same marijuana it was 20 or 30 years ago. No, it's not. So how, how do you say it's not a, a, a addictive or habit-forming? Right. So you just simply have to look at the... The, the data points that you have available. And so I would say on the on the on those data points, all in, the data is not great for for medical cannabis use, but it is not it is not uh, heavily against it. It's uh, the truth always is in the middle and it is in the middle here. Yeah. If you select the patient appropriately and we, we have a law that guides us with certain conditions and you you risk stratify them like you're supposed to as mm-hmm. a clinician, and you introduce the treatment in a sensible way and guide them, your chances of having a failure or putting them at risk is very minimal, just like any other drug. All we, right. we prescribe, Let me ask you this. Yeah. Is there any any doctor or person who's uh, cleared to write uh, the, the card has ever pulled a card from uh, anybody that you know of? In other words, and look, uh, this is a, you've been doing this for about a year and a half. I don't see this uh, getting anywhere, but uh, I think you're abusing it. Do you know of anybody who has ever pulled a card? Yeah, so, you know, I'm immersed now in, in operating seven of our clinics throughout the state. So mm-hmm. I, I do have a gauge of what's going on in the state outside of what we're doing. We have, we have had to deny some cards and pull mm-hmm. just a few cards for oh, that situations right? that yeah. we saw the, that the patient was at risk, yes. All right, we got more coming up on the other side. Ken, I'm going to ask you this. Um, well, let me do this on the other side. And, and the question's got to be, is any other state that's just medical marijuana that's been there for quite a while, that's got a track record, that some data has been compiled that is worth looking at because it's it's been there for a while, that it's pretty evident that they're doing a great job and it's not a gateway into recreational marijuana. Some statistics from Ken when we come back in just a moment. (laughs) Ken Newberger, Executive Director of Mississippi Medical uh, Marijuana Association, along with Dr. Kurt Kennard, President Paws Pain and Wellness. Where is your practice, sir? Uh, 
I have a pain practice in Oxford, Mississippi, where I uh, raise my family now. But yeah. uh, the Paul's locations are spread out the state, from Oxford North, soon to be uh, Olive Branch, all the way down to Gulfport. So How about that? Meridian, Tupelo, Flowood, um, Hattiesburg. Um, we we're trying to cover mm-hmm. enough ground to be available for those uh, patients that are, you know, actively motivated to find us, and those clinicians that are not quite maybe comfortable with it yet, but don't want to hold it against their patients, and I hope they do not. Some of the uh, comments on the ceasefire text line at 601 879 Spent a couple of seconds on that one. Being a gateway drug, a 1950s call, they want their uh, opinion of marijuana being a, <laughs> a gateway drug back. Uh, the good Lord put Herb, Mary Jane, on earth for us to use. No processing, manufacturing like alcohol pills. Anyone who thinks a politician got it right making it illegal and alcohol, tobacco legal, don't believe in God, just politicians. Whoa. <clears throat> um, will it increase dementia risk, Carol and Sternville? That one for me? Yeah. Uh, we don't have evidence that in a medical uh, vacuum and sense where it's prescribed appropriately and stepwise and, and not to reach certain levels of use mm-hmm. uh, that, it, that it causes dementia. No, the evidence we have for, for uh, neuropsychological deficits in anyone that uses cannabis is hard, heavy use in your formative years before your brain is developed. Uh-huh. And there's an area of your brain uh, that we won't get technical with, but it doesn't develop fully until you're 25. And if you use heavy until then, up uh, during those periods, you have more risk of those things, but not after. Um, the marijuana is not the problem, according to Stephen the Delta. It's the person has an addictive personality; they'll have a problem. I think it's basically what you just said. Is beer a gateway to whiskey? Said Steve. <laughs> well, yeah. well, ma- maybe so. Is, is tequila is a gateway to being buck naked? <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm just I'm just seeing Ken. Yeah. Uh, right. I, I, the question I was going to ask you when we came back yeah. is when you look at some of these states that have been on medical marijuana for a while now, we're we, we're they've done that long enough to get some data in. And then we can put the rest on some of these states, maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, they didn't just do this to get into as a gateway to recreational. And, and I'm, 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 I'm feeling more confident that we are one of those states that says, look, we're going to do this and we're moving slow and we're going to do this for medical purposes and that's it. Well, um First, I'm, I'm Irish, so beer might be a gateway to whiskey. Um, <laughs> no, there's no might about it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you know, if you look at states that are still medical who have rejected um, recreational initiatives like Arkansas, mm-hmm. um, that's definitely the case, that there is a, a big focus to make sure that medical is done slowly and correctly. But even in states that have moved from medical to including a recreational program, Um, the ones who did it slowly have a vibrant medical program because that program is focused on treating patients rather than just dispersing cannabis across the state. Um, And I I think we're going to see that here as well, that the focus is how do we make sure that patients have this alternative form of medicine? How many dispensaries do we have? Another question on C Spire text line. Well, we have about 170 licensed dispensaries. But we only have about 50 who are actively open. Those changes that were made in, in this year's legislative session won't take place till uh, July the 1st, or were any of them upon um, passage? The whole bill was upon passage. Oh, it was upon passage. Is that going to speed it up a little bit as far as the certifications from the Department of Health? It certainly will. Um, you know, the Department of Health is trying to catch up with a lot of the the demands that are in the bill, like mm-hmm. um, they shortened the amount of time to respond to a patient and, and tell them that they are either approved or denied uh, from, I think it was 35 days, they speed it up to 10. Um, and just making that change takes some time for them to actually staff up and become ready to do it. So yeah. I think within the next three to four weeks, we'll see that actually come to effect. Dr. Kennard, a couple of questions. One from Brandon in Brookhaven. Speak on the treatment of adolescents. Uh, well, what what has that shown to be a, a, a factor in our state? Yeah, so I think the treatment of adolescents in, in pediatric age patients has always been a sensitive uh, 
uh, area and it needs to be reserved for for pediatricians and those that have a bulk of experience treating as adolescents so i'll say that first mm -hmm. so for our pause clinics uh, we are not treating minors um, unless there's like superior coordination with an expert in that scope of practice that that just needs help uh, and guidance and trusts us to do that the 18 to 25 year old range by the law requires two certifiers one being a physician so that's a double barrier to protect that that adolescent age group okay and i think it's appropriate and like i said that region of your brain that needs to fully develop by 25 i think that's a good that's a good mark um if you have to have two people to certify that means two people have to step out there and take that risk with that patient mm -hmm. and uh and it, it it implies some extra barrier of protection so what what's what's the relationship between you and the patients you've been doing this for a while now all of a sudden you get patients in said we've tried all of this would you be opening uh, open to trying maybe cannabis right. and certainly if they're in, in my age group as far as boomers are concerned it's oh, oh, oh wait a minute that's that's a foreign substance to me and certainly if they've never tried it before yeah. uh how's that relationship working out where do you feel some negative pushback when you say that to a to a to a patient so the contrary paul so let me start with this. The average age of the about 5,500 patients that we've certified through our mm -hmm. seven clinics, who you want to take a guess on what that is? Um, I'm guessing zero. No. <laughs> the average age is 55. Of those no, 50... no, no, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I thought you talked about uh, the people who were reticent about doing that. Oh, no, 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 no. So the, the reticence, uh, I'll speak to that, but the average age being 55 speaks a yeah. lot to that, that this is a medical program, okay? If you're going to start using cannabis recreationally, you're not going to start at 55. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So even if, if, if you believe it was a gateway, you certainly would have been in that gateway already, right? So mm -hmm. um, in my pain practice, for years I have had patients test positive for THC that I, that kind of shocked me because otherwise I had no reason to believe they would be using an illegal drug. But if we don't look at it as an illegal drug, because it's not now, if it's used medically, um, the, the CBD oils and topicals and all these things, they continuously tell me how much they help. And so as we've introduced this, the patients do not want to be on opioids. Okay. The responsible opioid patient yeah. is tethered by it. They don't want to come every month and, and pee in a cup for me and follow all these rules. They do mm -hmm. not want it. They want pain relief and to end suffering. And so as they initiate it, they taper themselves off. <laughs> they don't have to wait on us to do it. I've, I've seen it in action. It's happening. I understand this problem with uh, the power of pharmaceutical companies in this country and, and elsewhere. But do you think somewhere in the future the FDA will come in and embrace this and it'll be a whole new ball game? Yeah, they'll do it because the pharmaceutical industry will force them to like they do every other time. Why right. the hell hasn't the pharmaceutical uh, 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 people jumped in on this themselves? Okay, so because it's been a Schedule One status. Um, and, yeah, and but it if still they did is. the research and everything and pushed it, yeah. they're the ones that are pushing this. Not some, They got more power than the politicians. Yeah. Well, they are slowly getting there. I mean, uh, Pfizer bought, I think last year, a pretty sizable um, medical cannabis processing mm -hmm. uh, business, I think up in Illinois, if I remember correctly. Um, so it, it, that, that was a big deal to the cannabis industry because it showed, hey, we're finally getting validation from even mainstream um, yeah. and mainstream pharmaceutical companies. So I think what you're talking about is close you know, in the next couple of years. Yeah. You know, yeah. FDA, the Congress, everybody, they move slowly up there in, in D.C. So I think we're going to see a, a slow movement, but we'll see it soon. We, we almost felt like it was coming any week after, and this has been a while back now, I almost forgot about it, where the Biden administration was talking about this. You heard, you heard some rumbles in Congress to go on and pass some laws so you wouldn't have that uh, the conflict between federal and state, but it never happened. Well, um, I, I don't. I'm not going to comment about the Biden administration's <laughs> efficacy, but I do think that the um, there has been a lot of discussion about how this is going to impact interstate commerce across mm -hmm. the the whole country, because every state has their own, you know, ecosystem of an economy that will get disrupted by interstate commerce. 
Does the certifying provider have to have a prior ongoing relationship with the patient, or is the patient just going to be a pot doctor to be certified? Richard, anybody want to answer that? Yeah, so you, there's a scope issue. So scope of practice comes into play. You know, I'm, I'm certified pain management. All my physicians are uh, that collaborate in my clinics. So that's our you. scope. So we can handle chronic pain, which is the primary indicator for, for cannabis. But final, out, segment, you know, yeah, the final segment is coming up next. We'll, uh, we'll complete this conversation with Dr. Kurt Kennard, President of Paws Pain and Wellness, and also Ken Newberger, who is Executive Director of the Medical Marijuana Association. Back with more coming up next. Mama's Lemon Pound Cake Afro Man. That's Afro Man. I knew that one. There you go. Come on. Ken, you did not. You knew knew that it was Afro Man. (laughs) Herschel says, I'm not a proponent of medical marijuana yet, but I am enjoying the current interview. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Herschel. That's a... That's a home run for the host. I'll drink to that. <laughs> Speaking of uh, pound cake, lemon pound cake, uh, w- what percentage, uh, Dr. Uh, Kirk Kennard, is, is your edibles to, to smoking? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very open-ended question, but a very important one. So you mm-hmm. talked about how is cannabis different now than in the 50s. It's right. very different. This is a very, very sophisticated and, and, and um, progressive industry that is trying to use as much science as it can. So there's a big difference. It's not all about the THC. You hear that moniker a lot of times, so I use it. It's not. There's 200 other phytochemicals in that plant that have potential medicinal value, and you've been used for thousands of years ethnobotanically and otherwise spiritually medicinally. Mm -hmm. And so um, the different ratios of that matter. The different forms matter. So, for instance, if you smoke, the reason recreational users like to smoke is they know what they're getting when they do that. Exactly. A puff means this to me. Uh, An edible is a little different. If you eat a fatty food with it, it could be five times as as much absorbed into your bloodstream as if you took it on an empty stomach. Patients need to know this because it can go off the rails pretty quick if they didn't know that one simple fact. Have you had some, uh, of course, we're told you couldn't overdose, but there could be some medical uh, reactions to that, some negative reactions, I'm sure. Sure, just like any other drug that has potential for side effects, which they all do. Um, And I hate to push you, but this is a real short segment, and I'm a little confused on this one. Do, does the law state that you can only prescribe uh, or they can only use the, the, the smoking for certain, for instance, um, if they have cancer or something like that? Correct. No, well, it, it's, it doesn't you, restrict you can it. Write, you can write either one that is applicable to the, the patient. You can. but you what can, you're saying. You can. It's, it's, it's open-ended, but you have the discretion as a clinician and okay. a prescriber right. to limit it to a non-smokable form if you think that's safe for the patient. I what, what, what percentage of vaping comes into there? So vaping is your next best option for a quick release type um, response with about 75% of the what would be considered the harmful byproduct removed. So it is a great option for, for quick release for like cancer patients and things uh, for breakthrough pain and nausea for their chemo- chemotherapy treatments uh, short of smoking it. Do they come back and give you some kind of a review on this one? Look, up, uh, this worked, this didn't work, this needs to be more powerful, because um, they have more latitude on how much to use with yes. this yes. Uh, than anything else. Yes, we're going to take those data points and use them effectively to treat other patients, too, and pay it forward. So we're learning mm-hmm. a lot, and uh, and shortly, like by the end of this year, we should have some formularies and things for different disease states yeah. uh, yeah. where we can implement this and make patients feel comfortable wow. going yeah, into it. This has been tremendously uh, um, uh, informative, and I thank you for coming. Yeah. Ken, you, you you let him do all the heavy lifting today. <laughs> I wanted to. Well, uh, he wanted I told to, him that also... coming in. We were walking in. I said, look, you look tired. You have a young <laughs> child at home. You're not getting good sleep. Let me handle this. <laughs> well, I, I also, you know, I, I'm not a physician, right? My, my degree is yeah. in ancient Greek, which is not <laughs> super helpful when it comes to, uh, to understanding how this breaks down yeah. um, like, like Kirk's does. But um, I, And I, I know the business. So I wanted to make sure that we talk about, when we talk about patients, we talk about it in a professional way. Paul. So fi- final thoughts on your part, yes. to Dr. Kennard. Uh, thank you so much. I was I was pushing you to give me my final thought. You got so it. So I'm going to use this. I want to use this. You can this. tell he's a listener, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. Go ahead. I was ready. So my final thought I'd like to use to say this. Um, 
as a board wearing the board of medical licensure hat okay uh, I'm not here to represent the board I represent that at our meetings uh, every couple of months but um, we're working with the Department of Health and they've caught a lot of heat um, even to the degree that they've been accused of, of, of trying to sabotage the medical cannabis program they have a lot of plate spinning and a lot of things to do for the public of, of Mississippi besides this it's it's been added in onto their plate and they've taken it on so in one calendar year we've gone from passing a law to having a product at a dispensary mm-hmm. no other state has turned it around that quickly so let's give them a little credit where it's due and as far as the board's concerned um the new legislative um, rulings changes actually took a lot off our plate and you know um so we're not here to overregulate. we're here to make if you're making sense of what you're doing so that scope thing i speak of if we want to certify one someone for ptsd or crohn's disease we can do it we just need a note from that physician that is in scope let's just keep it tight you got it ken do you know how many cards we have total so far uh, as it was it was a little over 6600 6, yesterday were approved yeah. um but they've got uh, a backlog of about 1800 or so i, I got you yeah. guys thank you so much i appreciate it Thank uh, Dr. Kennard, thank you for coming in, sir. Don't be a stranger. We'd love to have you back on. PauseThePain.com. Thank you. you. You got it.